Well, I am Bill O'Neill, an alcoholic. By the grace of God, in the AA program and attempting to follow this way of life one day at a time, I've been able to maintain sobriety 17 years, four months, and six days. For that, I'm eternally grateful. Back in 1946, 47, 48, 49, and 50, the AA groups all over the state of Texas would have laid you 100 to 1 odds that I would never make a year. Because you see, I came to AA in, 19, in September of 1945. And that big book that I bought on my first contact with AA, because those men down at Fort Worth told me that I was a sick man and not a sorry and no account bum, that I had long since given up that I was, and everybody that knew me had told me repeatedly that I was. So when these men told me, said, you're a sick man, you're an alcoholic, you have a disease, and this disease can be arrested. Well, as fogged up and all as I was, I told them I'd been arrested enough. I didn't want that anymore. <laughs> they said, well, that's not the kind of arrest we mean. I said, did you ever hear of a patient having tuberculosis, going to the hospital and getting healed to the extent that he could go home and live a fairly normal life if he would do certain things each day? I said, yes, I've heard of that. And he said, well, Alcoholics Anonymous is that same type of program. You can learn to live without alcohol if you will do certain things. And these certain things are outlined in the big book called Alcoholics Anonymous. You take this book with you and you study it and you read it and you do what it says to do and you can arrest your disease where it will no longer be necessary for you to get drunk. Because you see, for many years it had been necessary for me to get drunk. Our big book says that we tell what we were like, what happened, and what we were like now. Well, I have, in these 23 years that I've been around AA, because from 45 until 51, I went to AA regularly all over the state, because the book said that uh, anytime you needed help or you could call an AA member, and they'd come and sit with you and help you get sober. So I called them in all parts of the United States. Everywhere I'd go, I'd get drunk in the hotel and I'd pick up the phone and call AA and say, I'm up here drunk. Somebody come up and sit with me and help me get sober. And they did. book also said no hour could be too late, no day too long, and the weather not too bad. So I called them in blizzards and I called them at 2 and 3 o'clock in the morning and they came. But eventually I wore them out. They said, we believe you're one of that 25% that the book talks about. We don't believe that you're ready for this program. We don't think you want it bad enough. Because the big book says that you must be willing to go to any lengths to get this. I thought that I was trying. I thought that I was attempting to get this. But I was like Gordon. You see, I had not accepted fully and humbly that first step that I was powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. Now, I bragged about being an alcoholic. I cried about being an alcoholic. I cussed about being an alcoholic. And I prayed about being an alcoholic. But that's as far as I went. I didn't accept the fact that my life was unmanageable, drunk or sober. I thought, you see, as long as I wasn't drunk, that I was, everything was all right. But then I was lying to myself because, you see, way back yonder, on the first drink that I ever took, I found that when I was without a drink, I wasn't the man that I wanted to be. I was raised out here in West Texas in a little town called Abernathy. One eleven children. My father was a building contractor, and we also farmed a section to two sections of land, whatever he could lease or rent or buy for us to work because we had to do all that in order to live. And as a kid, I had to get up at 3.30 and 4 o'clock in the morning, go out and feed the hogs, the chickens, the horses, and milk the cows, and work in that field all day long. When I started to school, either in the second or third grade, while well, this teacher introduced me to that little story about Aladdin and his magic lamp. 
He rubbed this lamp and that genie appeared and Aladdin told him from genie what all he wanted. And the genie said, Master, yes, you can have it. And he'd do it for him. So I started looking for that lamp. I looked around all the junkyards and everybody's house that we'd work on. I'd, I'd, I'd search their trash pile and their barns to find me a magic lamp because I wanted that genie to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and milk those cows and let me lay in bed. I, I didn't want to do this work. And I searched and I searched and I searched. But at the age of 18, I had finished high school and was working with two of my brothers building houses up in Mule Shoe, Texas. My cousin and the sheriff's son and I run around together all the time. My cousin had the car. My sheriff's son had the prestige. He could keep the law off of us. And I was working for my brothers making two and a half a day, and that was big money back in the 20s. So I had the money, and we we, we run around together and, and partied a lot. And they wanted to go to a public dance over at Clovis, New Mexico on a Saturday night. A big-name band was playing there, and I had never danced publicly, and surely had, uh, I was even afraid to walk in a big hotel, and that Hilton was new over there. They said, it'll be all right. Let's go. Morris said, I'll get a pint of whiskey out of the jail somewhere. They said, I've got the keys to the courthouse, but I don't have the keys to the jail cell. I said, somehow or other, we got to figure out how we can get some whiskey that Dad's got stored up there in one of those cells. and We'll take that whiskey with us, and we'll take a few drinks, and it'll be all right. Well, I figured out how to get the whiskey. I went out and got some little sash cord rope, a little white rope about as big as your little finger, and I roped a pint of that whiskey and pulled it through those bars, and we took it to Clovis with us. Got on the parking lot there at the Hilton Hotel. They opened the whiskey, and each one of them took a drink, smacked their lips how good it was, and I had never tasted whiskey. I took a big drink, and I gagged, and I spit and spluttered, and said, for crying out loud, you mean people drank this kind of slop? And I said, hey, just wait a minute, just wait a minute. <laughs> they lit a cigarette and smoked, and they said, now take another drink. I never, I hadn't even smoked up until that time. I was already approaching my 18th birthday. This was in November. I took another couple of big swallows of it, and this time it didn't gag me so bad. We got out of the car and started for the hotel, and boom, just like that. That whiskey hit me, and this feeling came over me, and I said, what is this? And this inner voice said to me, I'm the genie of the bottle. I'm what you've been looking for. I'll make you the best dancer on that floor tonight. You're already the best dressed man here. I walked in the lobby of that hotel right across to the cigar counter, tossed a quarter on the desk and told the girl there, give me a package of Lucky Strikes. First package of cigarettes I'd ever bought in my life. I tore that package open, lit a cigarette, just like I was a man of the world. Went upstairs and looked that room over and I knew every girl in there saying, boy, what a handsome guy he is. He's the man we want to dance with. I walked over to the prettiest one I could find and said, come on, honey, let's dance. I'll show you what this is all about. I danced a few sets and I thought, man, if, if uh, those two or three drinks will make that genie appear and give me the oldest power, I'd better call on him again. He said, yes, just ask him and you can have anything that you want. I went down, took me another drink or two and come up, up and danced. And I come to the next morning laying in the snowbank behind my house, my brother's house there in Mewchu. The boys told me I passed out right in the middle of the dance floor about 11 o'clock. And that wasn't bad enough when they went to pick me up to carry me downstairs while I tossed up all that whiskey. And they, in the meantime, I, they saw I was getting drunk and they had taken me out and fed me some chili to try to get me a little bit sober. <laughs> so on this dance floor in the Hilton Hotel, the first time I ever took a drink of whiskey in my life, uh, and of course they had things to say, I imagine, because but I don't remember it. Anyway, they tossed me in the rumble seat of that old Ford and took me back to view two and just throwed me in the soul bank cousin told me the next morning, he said, well, Lord, we thought you'd come to in a little while and go in the house, but I was just blue when I came to the next morning. <laughs> of course, my brother had things to say to me, too, and I swore then. I'm like a Mexican there we heard talk out at the, at the Jamboree at El Paso this, this past weekend, Tucson, Arizona, and Jose said he had the most promising career of any man in the world, said he promised everybody that he ever knew every week and every month regularly 
that he'd never do it again. Well, I promised me and my brother and everybody around me then that I would never touch a drink of whiskey again. But a few months later, on a picnic we was going to, Morris said, uh, Dad's got some beer. Don't have any whiskey, but he's got some beer up there in the jail cell. Let's get some of that. And so we went up and got 12 bottles of that, took it out to the sand hills and iced it down. And then they opened it while that blue smoke just curled out of that home brew and stink. Man, you never smelled a skunk. It stunk his back. But I remember this genie of that bottle, and I wanted to have confidence enough, because, you see, I was shy. I didn't... Uh, I didn't have nerve enough to ask a girl for a date up until this time. And I knew that the bottle or two of this in me, why I could uh, get a date with one of these girls that was coming out there from high school on this high school picnic. So I drank two or three bottles of that skunk beer. None of the rest of them would touch it. That genie of that bottle says, drink with me and you can be what you want to be. You can have what you want to have. So I drank it. Of course, for two or three weeks there, my sister-in-law wouldn't let me sleep in the house. I had to sleep out in the garage, and when I'd walk downtown, nobody would come around me. I stunk so from that old skunk beer I drank. But every time I wanted to do anything that I didn't have a nerve to do, every time I wanted to be something that I thought I ought to be, I remembered the genie in the bottle, and I called on him for men on. 1939-35 on Christmas Eve night, I called on this genie to give me nerve and give me the ability to do the things that I wanted to do. And I was heading for Lubbock, drunk, driving a car, and run over a man, tore my sister's car all to pieces, broke my jaw, knocked out my front teeth, and cut my left eye wide open. And laying in the hospital up in Lubbock, having that eye removed, I guess I was kind of going under the influence of ether because I started talking to this genie. I had never talked to him on, without first having a drink of him before. I talked to the genie. I said, look, boy, you're getting me in trouble. Look what you did. You caused me to lose my eye. He said, no, master, that wasn't me. That was those other people. So there he gave me the reason for all of my troubles. From then on, every time I had any trouble, and from then on, every time I got in jail, every time anybody didn't do the things that I wanted them to do or told me that I wasn't acting like I should act. And this genie would tell me, uh-uh. No, it's not you. It's those other people. They are the ones. They are the fault. They are the blame. This genie told me laying there on that operating table that that old boy was to blame. He had no business being on that highway that night at midnight for me to run over. Two years later up in Oklahoma, I lost his left arm driving drunk. Passing a Greyhound bus, making 90 miles an hour, and so drunk I shouldn't have even been driving. I had five people in the car with me. I met a car, sideswiped him, trying to get around the bus. Knocked this arm off, and he rolled he rolled me back into the bus, and the bus bumped me right down the highway. We rolled over four times. The highway patrol told me the next day. I was the only one hurt. The other five people in the car were bruised and shook up, but none of them hurt at all. And I had another conversation with this genie. I said, look what you did now. You've taken my eye and you've taken my arm. He said, no, master, this was not me. It was those people. They did this to you. It wasn't your fault. So I was resentful and I was full of hate for this man that was on that highway and never did know his name. Don't till this day. But one of them, when I got out of that hospital, I was going to go look him up, and I was going to kill him for causing me to lose my arm out there on that highway that night. I already started building up hates and resentments against people for doing these things to me because this genie kept telling me, no, master, it's not you, it's those people. So every time I got into a rough situation, every time I had something to face that I didn't have nerve enough to face, I called on the genie, and I said, now, do this and do that. And he'd say, yes, master. But then one day I opened a bottle. I'd been in jail, and I was sick. I got out of the jail, and I went to the nearest bar, and I got a big drink, and I called on this genie. I said, now, I want you to give me the ability to get even with these people that lock me up down there for nothing. Of course, I was drunk, and trying to tear up a place they told me when they come arrested me. And this genie laughed at me and said, No, no, said, Up until this time, I have been your slave. 
I've done everything for you that you wanted done. I've given you confidence. I've given you the ability to do things that you didn't have the ability to do. I've given you the ability to be things that you weren't capable of being without me. But said now, I am no longer your slave. From here on out, you're going to be my slave. I said, oh, no. No, sir. He said, oh, yes. Yes, you're going to be my slave. I said, it may take me a while, but I'm going to put you in the gutter. I said, you see, as my slave, you can't have friends, you can't have relatives, you can't have a job, you can't have family. Of course, by this time, I'd married, and we were, had two of our children. And I said, no, you'll never do that to me. He said, oh, yes, I will. So we started this internal fight, me and the genie. I couldn't get along without him, but I was going to prove to him that I was still his master, that I would make him do what I wanted him to do. I'd make him give me the confidence, of course. By this time, I had quit working as a painter long since and gone to selling, and I'm in Cincinnati, Ohio, selling furnaces for Holland Furnish Company. And I needed this genie to give me the self-confidence and the ability to sell to make the money that I thought I ought to have in order to support my family properly. But little by little, it got to where I couldn't get to work on Mondays, and then it became Tuesday so that I couldn't get to work, and eventually it became Wednesday I couldn't get to work because, you see, I had started, all, started my drunks on Friday and Saturday early. I'd be so drunk over the weekend that I couldn't get in shape to go back to work, and I fought, and I fought with everything that I did. Quit that job, and I went to work for a man selling household equipment. I figured that if I got out of a big company that I was in and went to work for a smaller company where I could cover up this drinking and they wouldn't notice it. So I'd been with this man about six months selling uh, household equipment. Uh, Interspring mattresses and Rogers silverware and dishes and blankets and everything that factory workers needed in their homes. Uh, this company sold them 50 cents down and 50 cents a week. Well each deal that we had cost 29.50 and I made nine and a half of each one of them. And they wasn't any trouble at all sell 10 or 15 of them a day. Just as many people as I could talk to, that's all what I could sell. And I'd get, I could do this work three, four, five days, some weeks. Other weeks I could only work a couple of days. But I was able to get along, and I thought I was hiding it. And one morning, Mr. Friedman told me, he said, Bill, I want you to go down to the warehouse with me this morning. Got to check over the stock, and I'd like to, if you'd help me take a little inventory. We rode down on the riverfront down there, and instead of parking at the back of their big warehouse, he parked away up at the end. There's about 50 big tin buildings down there that are warehouses facing the river. And we walked between the river on the dock there, between the river and the front of the buildings going down. The sun's just coming up, and I walk by one or two, and I keep noticing guys huddle up against the buildings over here. Directly, I happen to pay more attention to one couple of them, and I walked over to them. They're bleeding. One of them's lower lips bleeding awful bad, and I leaned over and looked at him, and he's eat plumb into the bone. The other's got his ear eat off. And I got away from him, walked on down. Mr. Friedman's still walking, hadn't paid any attention to me, and I walk on down, I get a side of a group of about five or six of them. And I look at those. They got their nose off, their ear off. Some of them got their fingers off. And I said, Mr. Friedman, come here. Look at these men. He said, yeah, I see it. I said, what, uh, what is this? He said, well, Bill, that's what I brought you down here for. What I wanted you to see. He said, these boys are sternos and winos. They panhandle on the streets, get enough money to, to get canned heat or cheap wine, and they get drunk on it. They got no place to sleep, so they come down here, and they huddle up against these buildings out of the cold, and they pass out, and the rats come out of the river and eat them. I said, oh, why in the world doesn't the city do something about it? He said, they do. They pick them up every morning, take them to the hospital, heal them up, and they get drunk and come right back here. He said, that's what I wanted you to see. That's what's going to happen to you if you don't quit this drinking. I said, oh, no, you're wrong. I'm not. And that genie inside of me just gave a horse laugh. He said, oh, yes, he's right. That's where you're going to be, and that's where I'm going to put you. And I said, I'll be damned if you do. He said, all right, you just try <laughs> So I fought him, and I fought him, and I fought him, and I swore every time I took that drink, that insides of me would cry and scream. 
I need to put you down. I'm going to put you down. I'm not going to take you. But yet I had to go ahead and drink it. Because, you see, by this time I'd got to the state of alcoholism that I couldn't exist without drinking. I had to have it, and yet I fought it with every inner being that I had. I'm standing in a bar there in Cincinnati, down on the river, because by this time I'd quit drinking in the nicer places. I'd patronize those bars down at the river. And in these 23 years of our AA, I found that every man does this, no matter where he comes from. Because you see down there on that riverfront, I run into college professors. I run into men who had been scientists. I run into men who had been ministers of all different churches. I run into men from all walks of life. And they're down there in rags. That's where they had ended up. And I found men in AA that came from all walks of life. I think that's what, it, what attracted me because these men there in Fort Worth that talked to me, the first time I found that one of them was a scientist and he had gone plumb to the gutter in Houston before he got into AA and now he was on his way back up he had four years of sobriety and that impressed me greatly because I remembered I'd go down on the waterfront there and around the river in Cincinnati so I could talk to these people you see I still had a good suit of clothes I was still somebody but I could talk to them they were lower and they were beneath me I couldn't talk to these people up up uptown because, see, I, I, I knew inside of me that they knew what I was, that I was a drunk, that I was a bum, and yet I didn't want to be a drunk, and I didn't want to be a bum. But I'm standing in this boy that morning, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I'm talking to this genie again. I said, I'm going to control you. You're going to be my slave yet. Now then, give me the ability this morning to go to work because I need to earn the money to pay the rent. He said, no, no, you're my slave. I'm not going to give you the ability to do anything except to go to the gutter. And I said, by God, you will never put me in the gutter. He said, by God, I couldn't. But said, you can't find God. You haven't the ability. You don't know anything about him. Well, I had been raised in the church. I thought I knew about God. So I started making a search. And I went and talked to every minister of every denomination that I could find. I didn't tell them I was an alcoholic. I didn't tell them that I was a drunk. I just told them that I, 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 found, I found that I had a, uh, an uneasiness, an unhappiness within me. I was raised in the Baptist church, and I saw too many of those Baptists that were hypocrites, and I didn't want to be like them. I wanted, I wanted to find the God that uh, they taught me about as a child. I wanted to find a God that was kind and gentle and good and would... would uh, make things beautiful for me instead of the God that these preachers that had, on these hellfire and damnation sermons had given me they was looking down on, on me and punishing me for everything that I did and they tried to explain to me said all you got to do son is to pray just get on your knees and pray and ask God to forgive you and straighten up and be a man and you'll be alright well that was good advice but you see I couldn't pray and straighten up and be a man because this genie's power over me at that time was to, so great that I couldn't put him down. And I fought, and I fought, and I fought. And the more I fought, the harder it was for me to get rid of him. Of course, now, I'll not stand here and tell you that I stayed drunk constantly all of these years, for I didn't because of my body wouldn't allow me. I could just stay drunk for a period of a week, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes as long as a month or two months. Just drunk enough to be able to keep going and, and then get out on the weekends. But eventually my body would rebel, and I would have to get sober. And when I had to get sober, I'd, I'd stay sober for two, three weeks, or a month sometimes, two months, or three months. I'd stay sober long enough to get the monkey off my back. We have four children. And my oldest daughter, by the time she was five years old, had been in 36 of the 48 states. You see, I was a running drunk. I would sober up, and I'd say, well, yeah, I'll change pastures. I'll get in that a new territory. I'll go somewhere, and being a salesman, I could go anywhere and go to work. I wasn't afraid of finding a job. If I didn't find one, I'd make myself one, selling something. 
And I'd go to a new territory, I'd get cleaned up, I'd, I'd go to work for somebody, and I'd get the money rolling in, and then I'd send for my wife and kids to come and join me. And she would come. But I had to do this to get the monkey off my back, to pick up the checks, to keep from going to the penitentiary. And in all of these drunken years, uh, the Lord did protect me. He not only protected me the time that I lost my eye, that I didn't lose my life, or the time that I lost my arm. He protected me numerous times where I had written enough checks to go to the penitentiary, and yet somehow or other I would wiggle out of it and never have to go. And I drove all over the United States. I left New York City one time and drove into Cleveland, Ohio. And it was three days from the time I left New York until the time I got into Cleveland. And I don't even remember driving there. And the people who were working with me and riding in the car said, well, I drove perfectly all right. But I drove all over the United States drunk and never did get a DWI. Well, that's no credit to me. It's just one of those things that, that happen in this field of alcoholism. So when I wound up living in Brownwood, Texas, working for a company out of Fort Worth, and I went in on a Friday to get my check, told my wife I'd be back that night. And I came to, I'm in a little hotel room down there, not in the big hotel at Westbrook that I had checked in. I'm in a little old hotel, and the boys told me that it was right behind the clubhouse on 10th Street. I wanted to know who they were and what they were doing there and how come them in my room. They were well-dressed, nice-looking gentlemen. And they laughed and said, well, they were members of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I was having trouble over there at the Westbrook. And they checked me out and brought me over there to see if they could help me. And they were going to sit there with me and help me get sober. Well, I couldn't figure this. What, uh, who ever heard of me and this sitting around and, and watching a drunk and helping him to get sober? And I wanted to know what it was all about. So they started explaining the Alcoholics Anonymous program to me. They told me about the big book. They told me about the meetings. They told me about the thing. And every little while, they'd give me a little shot of whiskey. This is back there in 1945, and, and they, they wouldn't let you just shut it, lay there and shake to death. They give you a little something to kind of ease you off of it. And every time I'd come to, uh, there'd be two men sitting there in the room with me. I found out later that they put six men on me, two in a shift. And they stayed with me three days and three nights. And on the third night, they took me to an AA meeting. And I liked what I heard. I heard these men get up and say that they were alcoholic, their lives are unmanageable, and they told about the same type of story that I'm telling tonight. And uh, things, same things that happened to them that had happened to me. Outside of losing arms, you see, I was fighting with this genie all the time about uh, uh, him controlling me instead of me controlling him. And he had told me over and over, said, the loss of that eye and the loss of that arm is not anything compared to what I'm going to do to you. So when these men told me that I had a way to get rid of this genie that I had been using and that now was using me, I was interested. I was especially interested when they told me, said, you're a sick man and not a sorry no count bar. You're an alcoholic. You have a disease, and it's a disease that can be arrested. And they told me how. So I bought the big book from them, and I went back to Brownwood, and I knew that when I walked in the house that my wife was going to have things to say. So I was prepared to it for her. I carried the book under my arm with my suitcase in my hand. I dropped the suitcase and grabbed the book and handed it to her. I said, just a minute before you say a word. <laughs> Here's a book called Alcoholics Anonymous. I've been with a group of men down there in Fort Worth who tell me that I don't have to drink anymore and that I have a disease called alcoholism, and this book tells all about it. Now, I want you to read it and do exactly as it says and leave me alone. <laughs> Well, needless to say, with her reading the book, me not paying any attention to it, well, three months later, this was in September 45, and in January, I got drunk. However, I went back to the AA club in Fort Worth before I did get drunk. She had told me, she said, you're some cantankerous and it's hard to get along with, and evil, I, I believe I'd rather have you drunk like you are. I better go back to those people down there and find out some more about this. So I went to them. But when I walked in the clubhouse... Now, I'm telling this for a special reason. 
I'm new this time, and I'm searching, and I'm sick, and I'm hurting. I'm hurting inside terribly. And you see, that's what made me always go back to drinking. It was no problem for me to get sober and stay sober for a while. Because my body would make me, and my finances would make me. But my problem was how to keep from going back to drinking again. And that's what I was looking for this day when I walked in that clubhouse down there in Fort Worth. Walked in there and there's six or seven sitting around drinking coffee. None of them paid any attention to me. None of them spoke to me. And I had promised her that I would call her when I got there and let her know that I was at the clubhouse, make sure I didn't stop at a beer joint on the way into Fort Worth. So I put in a long-distance call to Brownwood, and, of course, my phone had long since been cut off, and I was having to call the grocery store across the street and persuade him to put it on the cuff. I'd call collect, and I was waiting for him to get her to the phone. And when the phone rang, I know now it was a house man, but I didn't know then who he was. Answered the phone, and he said, Who is the no-account so-and-so that the long-distance call in on this phone is not allowed? Well, that's all I was waiting for. I hit the floor about one time before I hit him, and I told her, I said, I'm down here at this so-called clubhouse, but the people that sobered me up three months ago are not here. This is a bunch of no-count bums down here, and I'm not going to be associated with them. You see, by them not speaking to me, them paying no attention to me, and them uh, giving me the cold shoulder when I walked in, that's what I had been receiving so much everywhere I went, that that old hurt and that old anger and that old resentment uh, came back again. And I went out and got drunk. And I continued that pattern for the next six years. I was searching. I was crying inside. And yet, this life that I had been leading and this way of life that uh, this genie had showed me in the beginning that I could be what I wanted to be or do what I wanted this way of life that uh, this genie had showed me in the beginning that I could be what I wanted to be or do what I wanted to do, that old arrogance and that ego was built up so that even though I was crying inside and begging people to help me, when I walked in a club room, I throwed my shoulders back and I had a chip on my shoulder and I just dared anybody in there to try to knock it off. I, I didn't have the ability, I didn't have the humility to walk up and stick my hand out and say, my name is Bill, and I need help. I looked them all over everywhere I went. And consequently, I got the same uh, treatment that I gave out. They ignored me. And uh, many a time I walked into a club room to ask when the meeting was so I could go to a meeting that night, and I'd get the cold shoulder, and nobody would stick their hand out to say hello to me. And I'd get a cup of coffee, and I'd, I'd sit there just burning and crying and begging inside, please somebody speak to me, please somebody talk to me. I'm dying. And yet when they'd look at me, I'd, I'd give them a cold stare and just dare them to say anything. And I'd go get drunk. But I kept going back. I kept going back because these old-timers that time kept telling me, said, one of these days, if you'll keep coming back, something will happen. And I'm in Amarillo, Texas been up there on a 30-day drunk in the Herring Hotel. I come down on the elevator one morning at about 6, dying for a drink because I've run out. The bellboys won't get me anything. And the beer joint back behind the place I know is not going to open until 7.30, but I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm praying that I can catch Jimmy. Maybe he'll come down early and let me in the back door. And as I stepped off the elevator, I run into two men who had worked with me down there in Brownwood. Uh, they finally found AA outside of Fort Worth in Austin. And these boys, one of them had come over from Eastland, and the other one would come from Cisco down to Brownwood to see me and sit with me and help my wife get me sober and take me to AA meetings. One of them's one arm, just like I am, except his right arm's gone. And he stuck that left hand out and shook mine and said, Oh, Bill, I'm glad to see you here for this AA roundup. And I said, What roundup? <laughs> I've been there in a hotel drunk for 30 days. Lobby's filled with posters about the AA roundup. This is in October of 51, and I didn't even know it was going to happen. I got away from him, of course, but that time Shelby smelled me, and, and he said, Oh, I thought you was up here for this roundup. They ducked their heads and they went on and I got away from them and 
I prowled the streets until Jimmy come down, and I got a six-pack, and I took it up to the room, and I killed him right quick and got that arrogance and that self-confidence back. And I thought, well, I'll go down there, and I'll find out about this roundup. Maybe they will want me to talk at one of their meetings. <laughs> So I walked in the coffee shop, and I saw two or three in there that I knew. And when they smelled me, well, they were disappointed, too. By this time, that arrogance had left me. And I'm talking to this genie. I said, now, I'm going to get rid of you because I'm going to make this roundup. I'm going to make it. He said, no, you're not going to make it because you've got to go back and get you another drink. You've got to do it right now. If you don't, you'll go to pieces. So I went and got another drink, and after two or three more drinks, I became so ashamed that I checked out of the herring and went to another hotel so I wouldn't have to see any of these AAs that had been working with me all over the state. And in this other hotel, I got locked out of my room because the manager found out that I was there, and I had given him so much trouble and drunks previous to this that he didn't want me in his hotel. I called a man I was working for and called a lawyer there who was in AA and got him to make him open the door and let me in at midnight. I got a pint off the bellboy, and I drank about half of it, and I thought, well, this so-and-so can't do this to me. Of course, in order to let me in, why, this man I was working for had to pay a week's rent in advance because he was expecting me to be there another month with him. So about 2 o'clock in the morning, I check out, and I make this night manager give me back this week's rent in advance, so he can't do that to me, and I went to another hotel. In this other hotel, I got sick. And about Wednesday, I started vomiting, and I vomited, and I vomited, and I vomited. I'd had ulcers for years. Those ulcers busted loose, and I started bleeding. And I bled Thursday, Friday, and all day Saturday. And th- Friday and Saturday, I have not. I, I bled so much, I'm so weak, I can't get off the bed by myself. I'd have to ring for the porter to help me to the bathroom. And Saturday night, I lay in there on that bed. Too weak to even, I haven't even been able to get milk or magnesia or buttermilk or anything else to, to go down because I'm bleeding so. I've got the room full of whiskey and vodka and wine, gin, alka seltzer, bromo seltzer, everything that I always took when I'd get on these sicknesses from trying to come off of a drunk. About nine o'clock that Saturday night, I said, God, please don't let me die here on this bed, drunk. Please give me the strength to get up from here, and I'll go out to that Washington Street clubhouse tonight, and, and this time I'll make somebody talk to me. Please, God, give me that strength to do that. And just as though invisible hands reached down and picked me up, I got off of that bed, went in and bathed and shaved and walked downstairs and drove my car 22 blocks to that Washington Street clubhouse. It was a big old two-story white house. Back door in the coffee bar was just about like it is there, and the long meeting room, 70 feet long, was here. I parked the car right at the back door. I'm just 10 feet away from it. I walked in, I walked over to the urn. It's one of those big pots like that. I get that stub there trying to turn that urn, and I'm jerking and sweating so that I... This is in October. It's cold. It's below freezing. But I'm just sweating as though it was the hottest day in summer. And I couldn't get coffee in there, and I look out on this meeting room, there's six or seven couples sitting there, and there's not a one of them even paid any attention to me. And I'm dying inside, and I'm solemnly begging them, please speak to me, please talk to me, please help me. I'm dying. Somebody do something for me. And they just stared at me. And that old arrogance and that anger came back, and I forgot that that uh, that prayer that I had said just about 30 minutes before that. And I slammed that cup down, and I walked plumb through that meeting room right by them, out the front door and around back to my car. I wanted them to know how indignant I was that they paid no attention to me. I, who had bothered to come out there to, to talk to them, and they wouldn't pay any attention to me. <clears throat> Got back to the car, and I couldn't open the door. This car is an old Plymouth that my uncle had given me, and it's got running boards on the side, and I sat down on that running board, and I talked to God some more, and I said, I didn't keep my word. I told you if you'd give me the strength to come in, come out here, that I'd, I'd, I'd make somebody talk to me and, and I'd do something. I'd, this time I would do something. I'm whipped. Please give me the strength and I'll go back in there. This time I'll make somebody talk to me. And I went in that back door again and I went to coffee urn again. And again I couldn't get coffee. And again they didn't say anything to me. They just kept on talking and laughing and paying no attention to me. 
Again, I walked out that front door and just stalked out, just as hard as I could, hardwood floor, and I'm just stalking. I fell in the yard this time, and I don't know how long I lay there. But again, I talked to God some more. I said I still didn't keep my word. What's the matter with me? Please, please help me and let me back in there. Please give me strength to go back in there so I can get somebody to talk to me. I don't want to die drunk. I went in the back door again, and this time I managed to get a little coffee in the cup. And I'm just jerking and shaking all over, and I'm crying inside, and I'm hurting so I could just scream. I got that cup up there, and I slopped that hot, hot coffee over my lips, and I looked around, and nobody paying any attention to me. I slammed that cup down, and out that front door, I started just as hard as I could again. And just as I got to it, it opened up, and an old boy walked in and stuck his hand out. Now, here's a man that I remembered seeing in AA meetings there in Amarillo because I had gone to meetings up there for three years, 47, 48, and 49, nearly every Wednesday night. I didn't know his name. Stuck his hand out. He said, O'Neill, are you still having trouble? I said, my God, man, I'm dying. He said, you look it. Come upstairs. I want to talk to you. Jack took me upstairs, and he set me down on a bed in the little room that they had up there, and he started talking to me. I thought he took my inventory. It seemed to me like he just skinned me because I know one thing he said was that I watched you the three years you lived down there at Clarendon and poor old Vady would drive you 55 miles in here every Wednesday night. And in your arrogance and your overbearing attitude, half the time you'd come here drinking. And if they ever made the mistake of calling on you, you got up there and bragged, you seemed to think that everybody in here job was to get up there and tell the biggest lies they could tell, and I'm quite sure that you felt like that you could outlie any of them, and I did. And he said they, a few times that they made the mistake calling on you, said, you don't know a thing in the world about AA. You got up there and told out, out lies. There's no humility about you. I can remember those few words. I said, Jack, I've got this. If I don't get it, I'm going to die. And I told him what had happened down there. He said, well, it seems to me like you're having an awful lot of trouble with the spiritual side of this, and it looks like that that's what you're going to have to find before you can maintain any sobriety. He said, maybe this book I've got downstairs will help you. <clears throat> I said, it helped me, and it's got the name of two more men in it that helped them. Maybe it'll do the same for you. He said, I'm going to give it to you, and you go back to the hotel, and you get your clothes off and get in bed, and you read it. And when you get over there in the back of it, you'll find the explanation of the Lord's Prayer, and it'll tell you in there that you have to forgive everybody clear back to your childhood for every wrong that you think they may have done you. Because, you see, you're, one of your main defects of character is your arrogance, your overbearingness, and your hatred. He said, you'll find something in this book that'll help you. Well, I went back to the hotel and got in bed, and it was a sermon on the mount by Amy Fox. And I started reading it, and it seemed to me like on every page it said, just what these AAs had been telling me for six years. That you have to be humble. You have to be thankful. You have to be grateful. And they had told me over and over and over, you don't have this program unless you carry it home, unless you take it home, unless you practice it at home. And I had never done that. I'd, st I'd maintain that overbearing attitude at home. My wife didn't have nothing to do with my business. She kept that house and the kids straight. I provided the grocers what little few that they got. And she stayed out of my business, and I was Mr. Big. But in this book, it said that that's not the way it's supposed to be. And in this book, I learned then what I had been reading in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And in the back, in the explanation of the Lord's Prayer, it said that you had to give, forgive everybody. So, because as long as you have resentment or hate against anybody, you've got them chained to you, just like you had handcuffs on them and handcuffs on you. And said after a while... Now, that burden of dragging all of those people around with you gets so heavy that it, that it exhausts you. And you get over overtired and you get angry and you get sick from it. So you have to forgive them, you have to release them and let them go. And then you have to forgive yourself too. Because you see, this self-hatred that I had built up for me because I was unable to whip this genie and put him back in line and make him be the power for me that he had been in the beginning. But in this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, I had read over and over and over that if you will do these things, then and only then 
can you ask God to do for you what you're unable to do for yourself. And in this book of Sermon on the Mount by Emmett Fox in the, in the explanation of the Lord's Prayer, it said, if you are willing to go to any lengths and to forgive everybody, then you ask God to do for you what you're unable to do for yourself. And if you have done these things or have become willing to do them, then and only then will he answer your prayer. I turned the light out and I said that forgiveness prayer just like that book said to And that room lit up like a million stars and the most beautiful music I ever heard played and I dropped off to sleep just like a baby. I woke up at 7 o'clock the next morning and went down to eat ham and eggs and I called Jack to meet me out at the club. I wanted to tell him this great news. And when I got out there, I realized that when I'd said that prayer the night before, asking for strength to go out to the club, my stomach had quit bleeding. And I realized the next morning that the fingers on this hand had straightened out, and they had been cramped up ever since I lost that arm in 37. I'd had it operated on three times to kill those nerves because they hurt so. I run out down the middle of Polk Street, just in my underwear, three o'clock in the morning screaming like a banishee because those fingers were sticking plumb through that thumb and I couldn't stand the pain. And those fingers straightened out that night sometime. I don't know which prayer it is. And they have never cramped up since. I told Jack about this and he said, I want you to remember this, Bill. This is given to you on a daily basis. And the only way that you can keep it is to be willing to share it with others. And that means that you go to AA meetings. That means that you make 12-step calls. That means that you go out. You don't preach to this drunk, but you be there willing to have him. And you remember this. You remember what a lonesome, horrid feeling it is to walk into a clubhouse and nobody there says howdy and nobody shakes your hand and nobody comes up and talks to you. You remember the hurt that you had. They... The anxiety and that crying inside of, from loneliness and despair that you felt. And you remember that every old boy that walks in there new has that same feeling. So you give him a hand of fellowship and you be willing to lead him and walk with your hand at his back, as Dr. Bob, our co-founder, said, until he gets strength enough to walk alone. And in this way, and only in this way, will you be able to keep this that has been so freely given you. Jack says, now, I'm not going to be around to help sponsor you. I'm leaving in the morning for Anchorage, Alaska. He was a newspaper man. He left my, He left that following Monday morning for Anchorage, Alaska, and I didn't see him for 13 years, but he wrote me every month or so by mail, and every time I had a problem, I'd write him, and I'd get the answer back six, eight, <coughs> ten, or twelve pages of it. Thirteen years later, he flew into the top of Texas Roundup to spend the week with me. He has infant SEMA, and he lives in Madison, Wisconsin now, and spends two-thirds of his time in the veterans' home up there. But he was a constant reminder that in giving this away is the only way that I can keep it. And, you know, after I started doing that, this way of life became so joyous and so full and so entertaining to me that I have tried to maintain it all of these 17 years. Now, I've been asking the question for the last three months of uh, various old long-timers and old-timers around the country. I asked it last November at Shreesport, and I asked it in January at Houston, and I asked it down at Tyler, and I asked it again out at El Paso. What is it that is causing these men who've had 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 years of sobriety, what's causing them to go back into the bottle? Because we've had a rash of them the past year. One one very prominent man that that I thought uh, was one of the finest AAs I ever had an opportunity to, to meet. We got to spend a whole weekend with him over in Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I've got his tape on, uh, talk on tape, and I've played it a thousand times. Back into the bottle and killed himself. And others have done the same thing. And, and I'm asking this question, what is causing this? Well, I got various answers. And I knew that somewhere, sometime, I had, I had read an article on this. And I was looking through some of the old things at home that I have. And I, I found the 15th anniversary, silver anniversary of the grapevine. And in it, Dr. Silkworth, who sobered up Bill Wilson, our co-founder so many times, wrote on this. He said... <clears throat> 
I hear so much about these people talking about alcoholic thinking and alcoholic actions that causes a man to go back into the bottle after years of sobriety. said, that's not it at all. said, the reason he goes back into the bottle and goes back to drinking is that he, quit, he, he stopped his treatment. said, it's just like a tuberculosis patient. He goes to the hospital and gets his TB arrested, and they send him home, and they say, now, you have to have so many hours rest. You can't overexert. You can't eat certain things, and you must drink plenty of milk, and you must do this. And he does that for a year, two years, three years, or four years, and then he gets to feeling so good and all, then he forgets that he has to take this treatment regularly. So he quits drinking his milk, and he quits getting regular rest. Next thing you know, he's back in the tuberculosis hospital. His TB has come back, and he's active again. Or he said it's just like a cardiac patient with his heart. They treat him in the hospital and get his heart back functioning normal, and they go home and tell him, now you go home and you can't walk upstairs and you can't uh, over-exercise and you eat properly and you get plenty of rest. And he does that for a year, two years, three years. And then one day the elevator's not work working, so he walks up two flights of stairs and it didn't bother him. So he decides, well, he's all right now, and he gets out and brings nine holes of golf, and he falls over with another heart attack. He quit his treatment. And he said, that's exactly what happens to these men in AA. They quit their treatment. And, you know, I got to thinking about that, and I got to recall another ones that I know of around this part of the country in these five state areas. They hadn't been to AA meetings in a long time, except maybe on their birthday. They hadn't been doing these things. And the big book says positively, these are the things we do, and we do them each day. And as long as I want to maintain my peace of mind, my serenity, and my happiness, and live this good life, then I must do these things. And that's what Gordon has done now for the past two years. I watched him do it once before for a year. He was the happiest man that you ever saw, and he, he enjoyed a good year. But he quit doing these things. And like he said, he had 11 and a half years of unholy hell. But now these past two years, he's doing these things. And that's why we're all gathered here tonight, to learn how to do these things. And it's very simple. I talked to a scientist, a man that's got a string of degrees 10 miles long, and he said this was the hardest thing I ever learned in my life. He said, now, I can take a mathematical problem and, and I can figure out the exact seconds it, it, it takes for a missile to go from here to the moon but said it's one near as hard for me to do that as it is for me to, to do these simple things. Said it's so simple, it's, it's utterly ridiculous. I said, well, you remember the greatest teacher that ever lived said, you must become as a little child. And that's what we do when we come into AA. We have to become as little children. We have to admit that we're powerless over alcohol. Our lives are unmanageable. So when I found God, then I laughed at the genie. I said, I did find God. So now I've got a power greater than you. And as long as I do these things, this power greater than that genie, that bottle of alcohol, will never bother me. Thank you for asking me here tonight.